누가 문을 두드립니다 조심 조심 들어보세요 문을 활짝 열어보세요 예수님 문을 두드리시네 누가 문 하이 문을 두드립니다 조심 조심 들어보세요 문을 활짝 열어보세요 Good evening. Hello, hello. Well, welcome. I hope you are having a good day or good evening. Welcome. Rainy but good. Thank you, Gerardo. You know, actually, it's been raining all day here in Southeast Wisconsin, and I actually went for went out for a, a six mile run this afternoon in the rain. It felt really, really good. It's something I enjoy doing. I like to run, and uh, I like to run regardless of weather. When it snows, I, I run. Um, and so it was raining. I took the opportunity to go out to run uh, uh, for for 10, 10 kilometers, which is about six point. Uh, 6.2 uh, something miles so it felt really really good um, and uh, yeah I think I think rain rain is a it is a blessing especially we only had a short uh, winter um, it's good for the farmers uh, for them to grow more crops uh, with with uh, with lots of rain well uh, tonight's title is the uh, I, I title it scarlet cord it's a story of Rahab and uh, it's one of my favorite stories that I like to share wherever I go and I, and I thought about sharing the story tonight uh, with you all so um, oh yeah thank you thank you <laughs> um, let's pray dear Jesus we'd like to talk about the story of Rahab this, this evening um, teach us I just pray that uh, the things that we get out from uh, get uh, take away from from this uh, story this evening may we be able to apply them in our everyday life uh, we thank you for the rain we thank you for uh, the awesome weather and we thank you for your goodness in Jesus name we pray amen um, when I share the story I usually like to start with the story uh, a, a narrative in, in Matthew chapter 1 Matthew chapter 1 is known to us as the um, this is genealogy of Jesus, and it's it's this genealogy of Jesus is, is unique because um, it has names of special people. Uh, I say special because they shouldn't be in the genealogy, but regardless, um, the author Matthew puts their names in. Usually, in a Hebrew genealogy, it's only the men, the Jewish men, that are allowed to be in the genealogy. But if you look carefully, as you know, there's actually names of uh, of, of of women. Not just women, but heathen women uh, that are mentioned here. Uh, if you look at verse 3, there's Tamar. There's also uh, verse 5, Rahab. Ruth is also mentioned. In verse 6, uh, the name is not mentioned, but her description is mentioned. Uh, Uriah's wife, um, Bathsheba, is mentioned. And if you go down to verse 16, you also have um, Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is very unique because... Like I said, it's only the Jewish men that are allowed to be in the uh, in the genealogy uh, back then. But not only were they women, but they were also heathen women, most of them, and they all had uh, uh, issues in their life. Tamar uh, slept with their father-in-law, which is a no-no. Rahab was a heathen woman. Ruth was also heathen. Uh, Uriah, adultery. Mary, conceived before getting married. So when you look from a, a social standpoint of view uh, back then, they were not allowed, their names should not be in it. And yet Matthew didn't care. He decided to put their names uh, in the genealogy of Jesus because there was so much meaning to that. And uh, instead of talking about all five of them, I'd like to just take the story of Rahab and see what, what allowed her name to be in the genealogy of Jesus. So we're going to go to the story of uh, Rahab found in Joshua chapter 2. The people of God are almost done with their journey of four years wandering in the desert, and now they're about to get into the promised land. 
And Joshua sends two spies into, uh, into Jericho to, to check out the land. Uh, the king of Jericho he hears about these two spies and sends the soldiers to capture these spies. And uh, not knowing where to run away to, they, they go to the house of, of uh, this woman named Rahab. She was a, a prostitute. Verse, verse 1. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And uh, soldiers are sent. They come and trying to, they, they come in to ask about this, uh, these spies, and she lies. She says, they went that way. But they were actually hiding on top on the roof. Verse 8, now before they lay down, she came upon them, up to them on the roof, and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you this land, that the horror of you has fallen on us, that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard. She says, we have heard. I mean, the, cur the spies are probably curious why this woman saved their lives, right? I mean, she could have won a great prize by, by re reporting them to the king. She could have received rewards for that, but instead she chose to lie to the, the, uh, to the soldiers and spare these lives. And this is, this is why. She says, we have heard of what your God has done to many people as you were traveling through to, in, in the wilderness. And, and verse 11, and as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above on, on, on earth beneath. Now therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show, show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. And spare my father, mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all they have, and deliver our lives from death. This is, this is really interesting because she says, hey, we, she doesn't say I, but we, the citizens of the city, have heard what your God is capable of, of doing, and he could do mighty wonders. And you know what? It seems like your people are going to take over a city. Spare my life as you have spared, spare my life. As I have spared your lives. I think it's a fair deal. But what really catches my attention is it was not just this woman, but the whole citizen of Jericho that heard the news of these people advancing, and yet this woman was the only one responding to these spies. You know, it's, it really sounds like us today. We see the signs, the, 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 the wonderful works testified by the Bible but not everyone responds to the wonderful works or testimonies of the Bible. It's presented to us, but it's only the few that actually respond to that. I think, I think there's great power in the Word of God. There's amazing things that the Word of God can do in our lives, and yet only few of us do actually respond to the amazing things uh, that the Bible can do for us in our lives. And this is what this woman is doing. Hey, I heard you guys. I know you guys are going to take over the city. Spare my life as I spared yours. I think that was a good sign for them. Verse 15. She let them by, down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. So as her house was on the wall, she uh, lets the spies go by tying a rope and letting them, letting them go down, down, the, uh, down the wall. And, and these guys say, you know what? We're going to come back for you. But because we're going to be in chaos and a lot of, we're going to be so busy trying to capture the city, we're going to need a sign from you knowing that this is you. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to tie a scarlet cord, a red cord around your house so that when we come to attack your city or take over your city, we'll make sure that anyone that is in your household, anyone that is in your household, we will spare their lives. But you must have the scarlet cord around your house, around your window. Verse 21. So she said, according to your word, so be it. She sent them away and they departed. And she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Now, the scarlet cord, the Hebrew word for, for this word is the word tikva. And the word tikva uh, in the Old Testament is mentioned 31 times, okay? 31 times this word is mentioned. And this is the only time in the scripture where the word tikva is translated as scarlet cord. The 30 other times that the word tikva is mentioned in, in, in the Old Testament Bible, it's translated as the word hope. It's pretty cool, huh? So, when you, when you, when you translate this, 
when you paraphrase this again, when she had tied the scarlet cord around her window, she did not just tie the, uh, she, she did tie uh, the scarlet cord in a literal way, but also she had hope that was tied to her window. It's just amazing what God can do. She says, I will do as you say. And she put the scarlet cord around the window, but not only that, she had hope of this, this salvation that was approaching them. I think this is the type of attitude that we should be having as, as Adventists. We, we proclaim the second coming of Jesus. We believe and say that Jesus is coming soon. And in the same manner that, that this woman has, we must also have hope in the heart that Jesus is coming to come very, very soon. Now the Bible is very clear about this. Um, as soon as the uh, as soon as the um, the spies left, it was that very moment when she had bound the scarlet cord around the window. Uh, why is that? Why didn't she do it just uh, uh, maybe a week later or a month later? The reason she tied it right away was because she did not know when this when the Israel or Israelites were were going to advance to the city. She did not know. Therefore, she had to be prepared that very day by tying the scarlet cord around the window so that she can be ready. I mean, doesn't that sound like uh, Adventist, the second coming of Jesus? The second coming of Jesus is known to us, but we do not know the day or the hour. What does that mean? We need to have the hope of the second coming of Jesus, but we need to be ready right now because he's going to come tomorrow or next week or next month, next year. We do not know. The only thing we do know is that he is coming very, very soon. And therefore, therefore, we have to be ready in the same way this woman was ready to receive, uh, uh, receive the people of God when they would advance to, to, uh, to, uh, to this home. There's a key word I would like to point out here in the story. The scarlet cord became a sign. When the Israelites would attack the city, they were going to capture all the people, probably put everyone to death, except this one house that has a sign. And that sign is a scarlet cord. In the same way, God also has a sign for us in our lives again, as well. And that is found uh, numerous places around the Bible, but Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 12, and verse 12 is very clear. He has given us a sign, and that sign is the Sabbath. Also, when you look carefully in the three angels' messages in Revelation chapter 14, it's very clear that Sabbath is going to be a sign between us and God. It's going to be a mark that tells us that we are faithful to God, that we are God's people. In the same way that Rahab had a scarlet cord, a sign around our house, we must be observant to what the Lord has told us, to be faithful to His day, Sabbath day, as that will become a token, a sign to God that we are faithful to Him, that we are His people. We're going to fast forward a bit. Going to chapter 6. Now Jericho, verse 1, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. Uh, there's, you could sense this high tension between these two groups, the cities of Jericho, the army of Jericho, and the army of the Israelites. There is this, this, this high tension that is sensed in between. And because of this tension, none are going out of the city and none are coming into the city. And that kind of sounds like the time of the end, just right before the second coming of Jesus. When you look at Revelation chapter 12, 22, verse 11, it says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be th filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Our, our faith has been sealed at that moment, the decision when that is to be made. None, in well, none went out, none came in. Wow. Sounds like the second coming of Jesus. And we know how the city of Jericho came down. The Israelite army had crossed over the, uh, the Jordan River at God's command. The Israelites uh, circled around the city once, twice, three, four, five, six times, once each day. But on the seventh day, they went around the city not once, but seven times. I mean, that, there's no other sign, clearer sign than this. I mean, it's coming. It's coming. These people are, surrounded, uh, are circling around the city. But on the seventh day, they were circling around the city seven times. 
And at last, and at last, verse 20. So when the people shouted, so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that wall of Jericho fell down flat. This again reminds me of, of the second coming of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4, verse 16. Here is a description of the second coming of Jesus, and it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And the second coming of Jesus, there's going to be a shout, and there is going to be sound of trumpets. In the same way, on when the uh, wall of, walls of Jericho came down, there was the sound of the trumpet, and there was a the sound of the shout from the people. And the walls came tumbling down. The Israelite army advances into the city, slaying everyone to death except one family. Imagine this. All the walls came down, and there is a, 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 a house that hasn't come down, a window that is tied with a scarlet red cord. When I think about this, I could only think of the blood of Jesus standing tall, protecting this home. I made a couple of emphasis in this message today. I emphasized the Sabbath and the second coming. But what matters most here in the story is the blood of Jesus. Yes, it was the faith of this woman that saved her. But also, the more important thing is that it was the blood of Jesus that saved this woman. Now, remember this. The spies had told her, whoever is in your household that is bound under the scarlet cord will be saved. So imagine this. Imagine what this woman had to do. She had to go convince her family. Hey mom, hey dad, you gotta come in this house because the Israelites gonna attack us. And if you are in this house with me, you are going to be saved. Now think about this. This woman was a, 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 a harlot. I don't think people took her really, really seriously. And think about the shame that her parents might have had, had on this woman, on their daughter. But regardless, she didn't care. All that mattered to this woman was with the safety and the salvation of her family. So she took all she can. She took every method she can to convince her, her family to be in this house so that they can be saved. In other words, she was doing evangelism work to make sure that her family, her friends, her relatives, whoever she was able to bring in were saved that very day. I see a lot of principles here today where we need to see the emphasis of the second coming of Jesus. We need to see the emphasis of the Sabbath in this story. But also, the most important thing was the blood of Jesus that saved this household. Now, what must we do? I think we need to go tell them the good news of Jesus, that Jesus is coming very, very soon. In the same way, this woman had to go out and tell her family. And you know, families are the, are, are the most difficult group of people that you could do evangelism on. But regardless, she had to go tell them because she knew the time was near. She said, Dad, Mom, brother, sister, my friend, you got to come in with me. You got to come in with me. And she did her best to do her evangelism. When we look at our, uh, around us today, there's a lot of signs that Jesus is coming very, very, very soon. It's going to happen very soon. We got to have the hope of the second coming of Jesus. We got to have a sign of Jesus by keeping the Sabbath. But this is all possible because Jesus died for us on the cross. Because Jesus made this possible for us, what we ought to do is go out and preach the good news of Jesus and do evangelism so that more people could know about who Jesus is and what he has done for us and that he's coming very, very soon. And I think this is why this woman... Uh, was, was put in the list of, of, of the genealogy of Jesus. She was a heathen woman. She was a prostitute. She did not deserve to be in the genealogy of Jesus. But he, Jesus says, I want her name in there. She deserves to be in it. Why? Because she took all they can to ensure her salvation, that she wants to be with the people of God. And I praise her for that. And I pray that this can be our life. That it could really, really change us, especially as we're living in the end times that we are prepared for the second coming of Jesus. This is my prayer. This is my message for tonight. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the story of Rahab. I pray that we could 
learn some important principles uh, from the story today. May we dearly await the second coming of Jesus. And you made it possible because Jesus, you have died for us on the cross. We're thankful. And we want others to know. So may we go out in this time of trouble and we proclaim the good news of Jesus and do evangelism. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good evening. I believe it's going to rain for a couple more days here in Wisconsin. Uh, uh, just uh, enjoy this weather, weather, and I uh, just hope that you keep yourself safe. Uh, you know, the strike, a stay-at-home order is not effective anymore in Wisconsin. Uh, and yet, I, I just urge you, ask you that you keep yourself safe with social distancing because the virus is still out there. Uh, just uh, keep your social distancing. Be safe. And uh, we will uh, meet you again tomorrow morning with our next speaker at 9 a.m. Have a good night.